Hi, I'm Oliver Edge 24 and you're watching Game Dev Corner. Subscribe for regular videos about making and marketing indie games. Today, I'm going to show you how to build a simple main menu in Unity using Playmaker. I'll probably make this video quite in depth, so if it's your first time using Playmaker or Unity, hopefully it'll cover everything. I'm also still recovering from a sore throat, so if my voice sounds a bit weird, or weirder than usual, that's probably why. I'm going to assume that you have Unity installed already, either directly or through Unity Hub. If you haven't heard of Unity Hub, it's basically a launcher that allows you to have loads of different versions of Unity installed on your computer, and then it brings them all together so you can load the correct version for the project that you're working on. It's really useful because currently the only way to update Unity is to download a new version and install it again, so you can quickly end up with many different versions installed. I've called this project Making a Main Menu. At the time of recording this video, the latest version of Unity is 2018.3.0 F2, so I'll be using that. Don't worry if you're watching this video in the future and you're on a newer version. It'll most probably be exactly the same in terms of following this tutorial. If you haven't installed Unity, pause this video and click the link in the description to get it downloaded and installed. You'll want to choose a new empty folder for your game, and then choose whether you want to start in 2D or 3D. This can be changed at any point later, so don't worry too much about it for now. Then click Create Project. It'll take a while to load, so don't panic. Behold! Unity in all its glory. Let's make the game view and scene view a bit more equally sized. Next, we're going to want to go to the Assets Store and grab Playmaker. It's on sale right now for $36.40, but it's usually $45.50. There's a link in the description below if you want to take a look in your browser instead of directly within Unity. Once you've downloaded it, hit Import. When I first started game dev, I didn't really want to invest any money, so the fact that it cost money felt a bit like a barrier to entry. But once I got over that and bought it, it really did end up being worth it, and it made it much easier for me to start making games. When it's finished importing, you'll get this welcome screen. Click Install Playmaker. Then click Install Playmaker, and the current version is 1.9.0. Don't worry if there's a newer version, the tutorial should still work the same. It'll warn you about backing up your project, but since our project is completely empty, let's click I made a backup, go ahead. Unity probably knows that we're lying, but they let us do it anyway. Thanks Unity. It'll take a moment, and then it'll ask you if you want to import more things. Click Import, we need them all. Bit more waiting around. It's surprising how much of game development is actually just loitering. Few more bits of waiting, and we're done. So let's close the Playmaker welcome window, and return to the scene view. First of all, the scene that we're currently in is one that Unity has made by default when we started a new project. It's called Sample Scene, so we're just going to rename it to Main Menu. You can think of scenes as levels, if that makes them easier to understand. But you can also use them for menus, like we're doing, or for intros, cutscenes, or loading screens, and so on. They're basically just a way to separate the different sections of your game. Once we've renamed that, I'm just going to right click underneath of it, and then click Create, and then Scene. Let's rename this one to Game, for now. Now if we double click Game, and open up the Game Scene, it'll look exactly the same as the main menu scene. So let's change something, to make it more obvious which is which. I'm going to click the main camera from the hierarchy. The hierarchy is basically a list of all the different objects that are in this particular scene. The main camera is our only object, as we chose to make a 2D game when we started the project. If you chose 3D, you'll probably have a light in the scene as well, and you won't have a solid colour for the background, you'll have some sky. So let's change the background colour of our camera to green, so that it really stands out from the main menu's default blue colour. Now we can save it, and then double click on the main menu scene in our project window, to load back into the main menu scene. Ah, default blue, we meet again. 
We're going to add a new object to this scene, so to do this we can right click in the hierarchy underneath the main camera, and then select UI and then Canvas. Think of a canvas, quite literally, as a canvas, onto which we can add all the different UI elements to our game, such as buttons, text, panels, sliders, scroll bars, toggles, and so on. We're going to confirm that the render mode for the canvas is set to screen space overlay, which means the canvas is displayed on top of the game. If we choose screen space camera, it gets displayed on top of a particular camera. If we were adding effects to the camera, like a blur for example, they'd also be added to the UI, which is something you may or may not want. There's also world space, which is when your canvas will actually exist within the scene as an object. An example for using this could be that you have a 3D model of a TV set and you want the main menu to appear on the screen of the TV set, in which case you'd make the canvas render in world space and move it around in the scene to place it on the TV screen. Next, I'm going to change the scale mode to scale with screen size instead of constant pixel size. Constant pixel size means that if you choose for a button to be 100 by 100 pixels, then no matter what size or resolution somebody is playing your game, the button will always be 100 by 100 pixels. This means that your game will look different depending on what size, shape and resolution each player's monitor is. By setting it to scale with screen size, we choose what resolution we want to work in by default and then the game will scale the menu to fit whatever size screen the player has. So if the menu takes up half of the screen for you, it'll take up half of the screen for anybody, regardless of the size, shape or resolution of their monitor. I always choose 1920 by 1080 since that's the most widely used resolution on desktop, phones, YouTube, everywhere. It's a 16 by 9 ratio which also applies to 4K and 1280 by 720 as well. If in doubt, go with 1920 by 1080. Next, I'm right clicking Canvas in the hierarchy, then selecting UI and then Panel. A panel is quite literally a rectangular panel on which you can effectively group UI components together. By default, it's set to stretch to the size of the object it is a child of. Our panel is a child of the canvas, which is 1920 by 1080, so it's full screen. I'm going to change the anchoring preset from stretched to center horizontally and center vertically, then change the size to 800 by 600 for now. If I right click the panel in the hierarchy, I can select UI and then button to add a button as a child of the panel. The button is embarrassingly small, so let's resize it to 300 pixels wide by 100 pixels high, so that we can make it a bit larger on the screen. If you look at our hierarchy, you'll notice that the button already has a child game object, which is a UI text. We can resize the font so it's more legible. I'm going to use 45 for now. We can also rename it from button to play. If you double click objects in the hierarchy, you can rename them. I'm going to change the button's name to play button to keep it clear. If I have the play button highlighted and selected in the hierarchy, I can duplicate it by pressing Ctrl and C to copy, followed by Ctrl and V to paste a new version. I'm going to rename this one to quit button so that we can easily see which one is which. You'll only see one button in the game view and that's because both of these buttons occupy the same space. One is on top of the other. We could manually move these buttons around but I've found a much more efficient way of handling it. If we click back on panel in the hierarchy, we can then choose to add a new component to our panel object. We want to add a layout component called vertical layout group. Components are basically scripts that have specific purposes. This one vertically repositions and resizes children of the current game object so that they don't overlap each other and are spaced equally. 
I'm going to change the child alignment to middle center as it's currently squashed against the edge of the panel. The panel is a bit huge for the buttons that we currently have, so you can play about with the width and height of the panel object to make things look better. You can either click and drag on the words height and width to pull the value around or enter the numbers directly. 400 by 400 looks pretty good to me for now. Now both buttons still say play so we're going to want to find the child object of the quit button called text and then just change the text field to say quit instead. I'm going to add a couple of extra buttons, options and credits. I won't add their functionality in this tutorial, but if you're finding this video useful and you want me to make follow-ups showing how to expand your main menu further, please do let me know in the comments. So I'm adding the extra buttons by pressing Ctrl and C with the play button highlighted and then Ctrl and V to paste a new one. You'll notice that the vertical layout component has automatically positioned the three buttons for us, which is awesome. Now, the order in which the buttons appear depend on their order in the hierarchy, so we can just click and drag on any game object in the hierarchy to move it around, and the layout component will automatically order them for us. Fantastic. I'm just going to rename it to Options button on the hierarchy to keep it tidy. Then we need to edit the child object of the options button and change the text field to options. Next, I'm copying the options button and pasting a new one, Control C, Control V, and then moving its order in the hierarchy by clicking and dragging. And then I'm clicking twice on the name in the hierarchy to change it to credits button. Now that we've got four of them, the buttons are looking pretty squished on our panel. So I'm going to change the size of it. We just click back on the panel game object and then we can change the width and height of the panel and the vertical layout group will take care of the buttons for us. I'm going with 400 by 600 for now, but we can keep coming back to it as many times as we need to. We can edit the padding settings on the vertical layout group to affect the spacing of the buttons. I'm going to add a 50 pixel margin to the top and bottom as I think that's how large the margin on the left and right are as well. I'm just going to rename the credits buttons text object to say credits as it still says options. Embarrassing. Okay let's make the game window a bit bigger and then we'll hit play and see what happens. The maximize on play button was selected on the games window so we get a nice full screen view. Beautiful. We can click on the buttons and they look like they work, but they don't do anything yet because we haven't actually added any Playmaker components to them. So let's start with our play button. Select it in the hierarchy, then in the inspector, we want to scroll down to the bottom and click add component. You can either type in Playmaker FSM or choose Playmaker from the drop down and then Playmaker FSM. FSM stands for Finite State Machine. That's the name of a Playmaker script. It's built up from different states, but it can only be in one state at a time. It's basically another word for flowchart. This is what the component looks like. We can change the name of the FSM, which is useful if you have multiple Playmaker FSMs on the same object. I'm going to call it Play Button Clicked. Then, in order to actually create the flowchart, we need to click the edit button to the right of the name. This brings up the Playmaker editor window. You can see at the top of the panel on the left, it says play button, which is the name of the object that this FSM is on. And then it says play button clicked, which is the name of this FSM. We have one state already on our flowchart and it has a global event plugged into it called start. Start is called when an object is active for the first time in a scene. Since our menu is already active when we load our scene, this will get called as soon as the game starts. Now on the right panel you have FSM which will tell you details about this specific Playmaker FSM, State which will tell you what happens on whichever state you have selected in the left panel, 
events, which is just a list of all the events that you've created, and then variables, which are little bits of data and information that you can store. We don't actually need anything to happen to the button until it has been clicked, so we can leave the start event and state one as they are. Now we need to add a new state which will contain the action that actually loads the next level. So if we right click in the left panel we can click add state to make a new one. This is called state2 by default but if we select it we can edit the name on the state tab at the top of the right panel. I'm going to call this one clicked as it is the state we will want to call when the button is clicked. Now we want to add a new event called clicked, which is the event that we'll use to trigger the clicked state. Then if we right click on the clicked state, we can select add global transition and then choose clicked. A global transition means that wherever you are in the Playmaker FSM, if this event is called, the transition will take place. So start is called when our game starts and the active state becomes state 1. Then when we send the clicked event we move to the click state. Now we can add the actions to the click state so that it actually does something. If we select the click state in the left tab and with the state tab selected in the right panel we can click the action browser button at the bottom to see all of the actions that we could add to this state. Now these are all the actions that come with Playmaker by default. You can grab extra ones from the Playmaker forum or from the Playmaker ecosystem. You can even eventually start adding your own actions when you have a little bit more coding knowledge. So we can either search for load level or we can go down to the level category and then double click on load level. This will add a load level action to our clicked state. Now it's got a red warning symbol because we're missing information on the action. We need to add a level name for it to load. You can either do this with a variable or just type it in directly. For now we're just going to type game into this box as that's what our game scene is called. We can now close the playmaker window. We then need to go to file and then build settings in order to add both of our scenes to the actual game. There's a weird empty deleted one here already so we can right click on that and then choose remove selection. Then to add our two scenes to the game we just want to drag them from the project window into the build settings window. They get assigned a number here as well, which we could use instead of loading a level by its name. I find names less confusing though, as if you change the order of things later, you still know which level you were originally trying to load. Now if we close that we still need to hook the button up, so that when we click on it, it will actually fire the clicked event that triggers the click state in our Playmaker FSM. We can do that by choosing the play button game object and then scrolling down to our button component. If you look at this on click field, we can actually use that to trigger anything we like when the button is clicked. So to add one, we just want to click on the plus sign on the right and then we get an action. Then we need to click and drag our Playmaker FSM component and put it into the click action where it says non object. This chooses which object we want to send a message to once the button is clicked. Then we just want to click where it says no function and choose the Playmaker FSM and then choose send event string. This lets us trigger a Playmaker event by typing in a string. A string is just a variable or bit of information that contains some text. So if we type clicked in here, it'll actually send an event called clicked to our Playmaker FSM. Then we can click edit on our Playmaker FSM just to confirm that the capitalization is the same. So if we click the button, it sends an event called clicked to our Playmaker FSM, which triggers this global transition to the click state, which runs our action to load the game scene. Now, if we close everything and hit play, we can test to see if it works. 
we click the play button and the screen turns green, which means we're now in our game scene instead of our main menu scene. Nailed it. 10 out of 10, we are coders now. Next, if we click back on the play button in the hierarchy and then scroll down to our Playmaker FSM, we can right click at the top of the component and then choose to copy it. If we go over to our quit button in the hierarchy, we can then paste the Playmaker FSM onto our quit button. I'm going to rename the FSM to quit button clicked to keep everything tidy. Then we want to add an action to our button component, drag our new Playmaker FSM into the non-object field. Then choose Playmaker FSM and then send event string. Then we just want to type in clicked again. Next, we want to click edit on our Playmaker FSM as it currently still loads the game scene and we actually want it to quit the game. Very different. So we click on the clicked state and then we want to right click on the load level component and then remove action. Now we want to open up the action browser and we can either search for quit or we can go to the application category and then double click the application quit action. That's now been added to our clicked state. There's no extra data needed, it just quits the game, so we're done. Coding is easy. Now, if we close everything and try to play it, you'll see that the quit button doesn't actually do anything. This is because the code that closes the game down doesn't stop Unity from playing our game. I think this is because technically, if it did run that code, it would close down Unity itself. Disaster. So in order to test that it actually works, we're going to have to build the game. Building a game basically just means exporting it so we can have the game outside of Unity and it can be played on its own. To do this, we click File, then Build Settings, and then just hit Build. Now we need to choose a folder to export the game into. Don't choose a folder within your project. Make a new empty folder somewhere else on your computer. Once you've chosen a folder, just hit select folder and then the game will build. It should, fingers crossed, be pretty fast because our game is tiny right now. Once it's finished, it'll open up the folder in which the game has been exported. You'll see a bunch of files and folders that are all required for the game to work. You just want to double click on the exe file to run the game. Mine is called making a main menu. Yours might be called something else if you chose a different name at the start. When you open it, you'll get the default Unity launch box, which lets you choose a resolution, quality setting and a monitor to run the game. When we're happy with those, we can just hit the play button. We can now test the play button. So if we click that, it works. We get our green screen. We actually need to hit Alt and F4 to get out of the game right now, but that's fine for this demo. Then, if we run it again, we can test the quit button. So we hit quit and it quits. Fantastic. Now, back in Unity, we might want to deactivate the option and credits buttons because we're not actually going to be adding them in this tutorial. We can do that by selecting them in the hierarchy and then on the button components, we just want to unselect the interactable checkbox. Then we can run the game and you'll see that neither the options or credits buttons can be clicked. Perfect. I'm just going to end by moving the whole main menu panel and adding a game title. I want my panel to be in the bottom left hand corner. So to do that, I can change the anchoring to anchor the panel in the bottom left. Then I can change the X and Y position to define how far away from the bottom left corner the panel should be. Once we're happy with that, we can add a game title. We can do that by right clicking the canvas object in the hierarchy and and then choosing a text mesh pro text object. They're very similar to normal text objects, but text mesh pro is much better. Once we've added that, we can just change the text to the name of our game. Be right back. I'm just going to ask Ruby for a suggestion. So 
so apparently this game is going to be called John Jacob Jingleheimer Schmidt. Thanks, Ruby. Next, I need to change the height and width of the Text Mesh Pro object so that we can increase the size of the font. I'm going with 1920 by 200 for now so that it runs the full length of the screen. Then we can edit the font size to make it nice and big. Then we want to edit the Y position to put it at the top of the screen. If we hit play again, we can confirm that everything is still working. Everything still works and that's how you make a super basic main menu in Unity using Playmaker. Please let me know what you thought to this tutorial and if you had any problems following it. If you enjoyed this video, please share it with anybody else who you think it might help and hit subscribe to find out about the next one. As always, leave a comment if you have any of your own tips and advice or if you have any feedback for me about this video or if you just want to say hello. Thanks for watching. Bye.